lot of things we can be thankful for this week, but I can't think of anything I'm more thankful for than the fact that we can turn our eyes upon him. You know, there are a lot of people around the world today that are desperate for life change. In fact, that's one of the number one Google searches on the internet today. How do I change my life? People all over the world are asking the question, how do I experience some kind of life change, some kind of life transformation, and how do I experience it now? In fact, just this week, I Googled that very thing. And I'm gonna give you the top 10 things according to the internet, ways to change your life. Do not include this in your sermon notes, okay? Here's what Google says. You want your life to change, create a dream board. You want your life to change, set goals. Do something that scares you. Travel the world, change your routine, get a new job, sell your house, get more active, change your diet, purchase a pet. These things will will change your routine. These things will change your circumstances. These things may even change your financial situation. I don't know. But let me tell you one thing. These things do not have the capacity or the ability to change your life. If you are taking notes today, get this at the top of the page. You ready? Only Jesus can change your life. Only Jesus can do what you need him to do. Only Jesus can take a person from death and bring them to a place of life. Only Jesus can take a sinner and make them a saint. Only Jesus can take a person exactly where they are and take them where only he can be. He can take you from a place where you have no hope or joy or peace. He can bring you to a place of complete contentment through faith. Only Jesus can change your life like that. And that's exactly what we've been talking about over the past several weeks. And we've seen that the life change we desire, it's only possible through him. It doesn't happen when Jesus is a part of your life. You want your life to change? It won't happen if Jesus is just a part of your life. But the change you're looking for will happen when Christ is your life. And that's a completely different story. That's what we've learned so far in this letter. As Paul was writing to these believers in Ephesus, he was showing them that when Christ changes a person's life, not only does he give them a new identity in Christ, he also gives them a new goal in life. In fact, he talked about the goal of the Christian life in chapter four, verse one, when he told the believers, walk worthy of the calling you've received. Do you remember that verse? That verse applied to them, but it also applies to us. He said, Christians, those of you who are in Christ, here's what you're called to do. Walk worthy of the calling that you've received. I can just imagine those in Ephesus opening up this scroll when it was first presented to them as the church. I can imagine them open that scroll for the very first time and reading those words, walk worthy of the calling you've received. Don't you know they were like, man, what in the world are you talking about? What is this walk that you're talking about? What does it mean to walk worthy of the calling we've received in Christ? Because even today, some of us are asking, how do I walk worthy of the calling? How do I walk a new walk with Jesus? But as they ask that question, as they open that scroll, I can just imagine them as they continue reading. Because Paul goes on to share with them, not only the goal as believers, but he goes on to share with them the how-tos of walking this new walk. And the how-tos of living a worthy life that God has called us to live. He told them, you want to know how to do it? Here's the first step. You got to take off the former way of life. And he told them that in verse 22. He said, take off your former way of life and then put on your new self. This is the how-tos of how to walk this new walk, how to live this new life. He said, you got to have a wardrobe change. You got to take off the sinful and the stained garments of your past and you got to put on your new spiritual wardrobe, which allows us to live the life that God's called us to live. Today, as we continue our walk through the book of Ephesians, Paul's going to show us from chapter four how walking this new walk and living this new life will always result in us living a different life. You're going to be different. If, you're exper- if you've experienced Jesus Christ, you're going to be different. It's not a, will I be different? It's no, you're going to be different. You, you gotta understand, if you are in Christ, you are different because you cannot be changed by Jesus and remain the same. When you new, walk a new walk and you replace the old life with the new life that's available through Christ, you will naturally live a different kind of life. 
And he goes on to talk specifically about what some of those differences are, beginning in verse 25. And we're going to unpack those today. In fact, in this passage, he tells us when you are in Christ and living for the Lord, you should blank. You should do six things. And I want to share these six things with you from God's word. And I want to encourage every person that knows Jesus in the room to write these six things down because they apply to your life. I want you to jot them down, grab a pen, grab some paper, pull out your phone, type them in your notes, but don't leave here without understanding that God's word applies to you and he's given us special instruction as we are walking this new walk together. He's gonna tell us as believers, the first thing we've gotta do, we've gotta replace lying with truth telling. We've gotta replace lying with truth telling. Look at verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth, each one to his neighbor because we are members of one another. I read a poll this week that said that 90% of Americans admit to consistently lying in their life. 90%, I thought it sounded a little bit high personally, but that's the number that was given. And when asked by one person, when, when asked, one person responded and said, well, here's the truth. A little white lie here and there never hurt anybody. Why do you lie? Because ultimately little lies don't matter. Here's what God's word said. There are no little lies with God. So with that being said, let me ask you a personal question. How many of you have told a little white lie here and there? Don't raise your hand. I don't want to embarrass you. And I also don't want to put you on the spot and tempt you to lie in church. Amen. But all of us have been guilty of telling a little white lie here and there. But the Bible says there are no such thing as little white lies with God. In fact, in Proverbs chapter six, it tells us that there are six things that God hates, and this is one of them. In fact, I'll go ahead and read it. It says that a lying witness who gives false testimony, is that something that God hates? So get this in your notes today. God hates it when we lie. Big lies, small lies, and everything in between. And he hates it because you and I are more than just individuals to God. You got to understand when God looks at us, if we're in Christ, he sees us as a part of his body. So because we're a part of his spiritual body, when we lie, we don't speak the truth. We, in essence, hurt the entire body of Christ. So Paul tells us here, if you're going to walk this walk, if you're going to live your life worthy of the calling you've received, you've got to replace lying with truth telling. When you're in Christ and you tell the truth, your life is being lived in a way that resembles God. It points people to the nature of God. Your words are actually honoring God when you speak the truth. But when you lie, you're living in a way that's inconsistent with your new identity in your life in Christ. That's why Paul says you gotta replace lying with truth telling. Let's go to number two. He also says replace sinful anger with righteous anger. You've got to have this switch. You got to get rid of the, the sinful anger and you got to replace it with righteous anger. Look at verse 26. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. This verse is actually just Paul rephrasing what was written in Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. In Psalm 4, 4, it says, Be angry and do not sin. Reflect in your heart while on your bed and be silent. In both of these verses, he gives us two clear directives. Number one, he tells us, be angry. Look at the verse. It's almost like he commands us to be angry. Uh, but then it goes on to say uh, that, that you're going to be angry. So why would you command us to be angry? I mean, look at it. It's like he's commanding us to be angry. It doesn't sound very biblical, does it? doesn't sound like something that God would speak to us, be angry. But I believe he says be angry because he knew that anger is a natural emotion in our life. It's something that all of us have experienced. There's not a person in this room that's lived their entire life without becoming angry about something. And so the first thing he says is be angry. And then he gives us a second directive that says, and don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Well, the question for many of us is how do we do that? How do we live this out? You see, for many people, anger is something that reigns in their life. It's something that grows in their heart. And the longer we allow anger to reside within us, it seems like the angrier we become. 
And Paul knew as he was writing to first century believers that unaddressed anger always leads us to unrighteous anger. We've got to get this one today. Unaddressed anger always leads to unrighteous anger. So if we have unrighteous anger in our heart, it doesn't position us to walk this new walk and live this new life. As, a, as his discipleship of these new Christ followers, I believe Paul was instructing them, instructing them here on how to be angry, but to do it in the right way. He said, you're going to be angry, but make sure you're doing it in the right way. You've got to address the anger inside of you. And you've got to address that anger in a timely manner. Because if you don't, he said, you're going to give the devil an opportunity to gain territory in your life. You're going to give the devil an opportunity to gain territory in your relationships. And he also said, you're going to give the devil an opportunity to gain territory in the church. That's what that phrase means, by the way. He said, don't give the devil an opportunity. Some text says, don't give the devil a foothold, which is another great word to highlight in the text. That word foothold, it's actually a rock climbing term, which defines a place to securely set your foot to gain leverage so that you can elevate even higher. If you've ever climbed a wall, if you've ever scaled the side of a cliff, you know this word. You know that if you, if you have a foothold, that, that's gonna allow you to climb higher. It's necessary if you're gonna continue to go up and eventually reach the summit. So that's what we're trying to avoid in this life, by the way. We're trying to avoid that as Christians. We never wanna give the devil a foothold or an opportunity to gain ground in our lives. But Paul says when our anger goes unchecked, when our anger goes unaddressed, that's exactly what we're doing. We're teeing him up to exploit our anger and our bitterness for his purposes. You get it? He said, for that reason, you gotta replace your sinful anger with righteous anger. The third thing he tells us, replace stealing with hard work and generosity. Replace stealing with hard work and generosity. Look at verse 28. It said, let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. When I was like five years old, I'm pretty sure I was a kleptomaniac in the, in the making. Anybody else as a little kid, you felt like stealing everything you saw? Just me. Okay, awesome. That's fine. <laughs> Man, I can remember. I was like five years old. I remember going to the local, the local uh, drugstore, walking the candy aisle. I was there with my mom. We had just been to the dentist, and now we're at the, the drugstore, and I'm walking the candy aisle back and forth, and I'm just, I'm, I'm lusting over the candy bars, right? I, that's just what I did when I was a kid. I would walk that aisle, and I would look at the candy bars, and I'm like, man, I gotta have one of those. Only this time, there was, a, there was an internal courage that came over me. And I can remember looking around to make sure no one was looking, and I grabbed about three or four of those candy bars, and I put them in my pants when nobody was looking. And now I'm walking around the candy store like this, right? I'm walking around the drug store like this, just making sure that everything is good. A few minutes later, we're walking out of the, out of the store. In fact, my mom was talking to the owner of the drug store. I was kind of staying behind her, trying not to move too much. And as she's having this conversation with him, I can remember thinking, man, just, just don't breathe. Everything's going to be fine. But then as they continued to talk, one of those candy bars broke free from my waistband, <laughs> made its way down my pant leg, slid down on the floor right in front of the owner of the store. And now in that moment, I can remember thinking, I'm dead. I mean, this is the last day on planet Earth for me, right? I'm going to be killed. I, of course, had to return the candy bars. I had to apologize to the owner. And then I went home where my dad disciplined me over and over again, I'm sure. But I realized very quickly that stealing didn't need to be a part of my life. I learned that young. And there's a lot of people who are still learning that lesson today. Let me ask you, have you ever stolen something that didn't belong to you? Have you ever taken something that wasn't yours? Apparently, this was a big deal in the early church. This was a big deal. Now, they weren't stealing candy, but they were apparently stealing something. Why else would Paul have included this in his message to the church? Many scholars believe he wrote this uh, to a certain segment of the population in the church, people who he called thieves in the Bible. And these are people that were freeloading from the other members of the church. 
Apparently everybody else was giving, everyone else was sacrificing and doing what was called upon. There were some who weren't doing their part. And these people in the church, they, they, weren't, they weren't givers, they were takers. There were people in the church that weren't contributing to the body. These people were only taking from the body. They weren't asking, what can I give when they showed up? They were only asking, what can I gain? And the Bible lets us know that Paul categorized their actions as stealing, and he labeled these people as thieves. Get this in your notes today. Stealing always stems from a sinful source. It always stems from a sinful source. No matter what you're talking about, you could be talking about stealing big or stealing small. There's going to be sin at the root of that. We steal when we don't feel like we're getting what we deserve. We steal when we covet. We steal when we're greedy, when we feel entitled to more. All stealing comes from a sinful seed. On the other hand, generosity, which Paul also speaks about, Generosity, as seen in the Bible, is always a sign or, or it gives evidence of a life that's been changed. So for that reason, Paul said, instead of being a thief that steals, do honest work with your own hands so that you have something to share with everyone else, so that you have something to share with the body. Once again, he shows us, according to the Lord, what we have is a lot less about us and it's a whole lot more about other people. There's something inside of us that said, no, 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 this is all mine. It, it's, it's for only me to have and enjoy. But when you look at that, according to scripture, it shows us that what God has blessed us with is a whole lot less about building our kingdom and a whole lot more about building his kingdom. So for those reasons, Paul said, replace stealing with hard work and generosity. The fourth thing he tells us is replace destructive words with constructive words. He's talking about our language here, and he said there has to be an exchange on the words that we speak. Verse 29, no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear. Let me ask you, do you believe that God is really paying attention to the words that we say? It almost sounds beneath God sometimes. You're like, oh, he doesn't care about what I say. And there's this thought that says, I'm sure that he doesn't listen to everything that I'm saying. I'm sure he's just like monitoring from time to time. And yet when you look at the Bible, even when words seem insignificant to us, the Bible paints a picture that says the words we speak are a big deal to God. They're a big deal to God. And I'm not just talking about the words we speak. I'm saying when we communicate with others, whether that be on social media or through an email or a voicemail or a text, when we communicate the words that we speak are a big deal to God. And I think they're a big deal once again because when we speak, we are in a sense speaking on God's behalf. You are. As a child of God, when you speak, you're speaking as a member of the family of God. And I believe that was Paul's message to the early church that day. He was saying, church, pay attention to what you're saying. Pay attention to how you're communicating, how you're tweeting, how you're commenting on that Facebook post. Pay attention and be sure that the words are constructive and they're giving grace to those you encounter. In the third chapter of James, it talks about how God is concerned with the way that we use our tongue. It doesn't seem like a big deal to us most of the time. But once again, it's a big deal to God. In fact, he says in James chapter three, he says our tongues are small, but the words that we speak have huge implications. Let me read a couple of those verses out of James chapter three. Verse three says, now if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies. And consider ships, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they are guided by very, a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how a small fire sets ablaze a large forest and the tongue is a fire. Your words, according to scripture, will either build people up or they will tear people down. They'll be destructive or they'll be constructive. And Paul tells us for the believer, our speech should be One, our speech should be filled with words that are giving grace and giving life in the lives of people around us. So for those reasons, we've got to replace destructive words with constructive words. Let me give you the fifth one here. He says, replace rejecting the Holy Spirit with appreciating the Holy Spirit. And this is for the church. 
He says in verse 30, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of redemption. See, the Bible tells us when we try to walk this walk alone, without the power of God, it grieves the Spirit of God. That's what that means. Paul was saying, listen, when we don't rely on God's Spirit to help gain victory over our anger, to help gain victory over our bitterness, to, to help control our tongues. It says when we rely on our own strength and we don't lean into the spirit of God, it says we grieve him. That word grieve, it's the word lipeo. It's the same word used in 2 Corinthians chapter two where Paul referred to the church's sin causing him grief and sorrow. It's also the same word used to describe the disciples grieving at Jesus's departure. It's the exact same word that, that's used to, to define the disciples' reaction when they found out that one of them was, was going to betray Jesus in Matthew chapter 26. That, that word grieve, it, it's, it's not just used to describe sadness, it's not just used to describe disappointment, it's a word that's used to describe a broken heart. So here's what we can take away from this text. We know all sin is painful to God, right? All sin is painful to God. But what this is saying is when his children refuse to change the ways of their old life and when his children refuse to, to ask him for power in their new life, it not only breaks the heart of God, but this says it grieves the spirit of God. Paul told the church, the Holy Spirit weeps when he sees Christians lying instead of speaking the truth. It says the Holy Spirit weeps while we have unrighteous anger in our heart. It says he weeps when we are stealing instead of sharing. It says he weeps when we're tearing people down instead of building people up. So with that in mind, Paul tells the church, instead of grieving the Holy Spirit, I mean, let's appreciate the Holy Spirit. Let's appreciate the fact that, that he sealed us and he saved us and he's with us and he's given us his power and his presence even in this moment. Let's lean into the Holy Spirit and rely on him instead of grieving him. And then lastly, number six, he tells us, you've also got to replace bitterness and anger with kindness and forgiveness. I want you to think about these words. Verse 31, let all bitterness, anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Can you imagine for just a moment what it would be like if the church practiced these two verses of scripture? Can you just imagine the difference? Can you imagine if our families and in our relationships, we just practice these two verses? and we were removing these things and we were adding things. Can you imagine what it would be like in America today if we just practiced these two verses? And yet when you read them, it's not that hard. Paul said, when you remove bitterness and anger and when you remove wrath and shouting and slander and malice from your life and you choose to be kind and you choose to be compassionate, check it out. He said, when you choose to forgive one another, good things are gonna happen. He said, it's a formula for success. Just read the word of God. And not only are you going to see, experience good things in your relationships and in your life and in your country, he said, but also you're gonna be able to walk in a way in which otherwise you cannot. Here's what he just told us. He said, remove everything inside of you that the devil wants to store. He, he, he said, he wants to store bitterness in your heart. You know why he wants to store bitterness in your heart? Because bitterness will lead you to sin. He, he said, he wants to store anger in your heart. He wants to store wrath in your heart. You wanna know why? Because by storing those things in your heart, the devil knows it's gonna lead you back to your old life, living in your old ratty clothes. He tells you, remove everything that the devil wants to store in your life and replace those things with everything the Lord wants to reveal through your life. You get it? He wants to reveal kindness through you today. Why? Because it reveals a life that's been changed by God. He wants to reveal compassion through you. Why? Because it reveals the nature of the God who saved you. He wants to demonstrate forgiveness through you today. You, don't know, you wanna know why? Because you have been forgiven and you are never more like Jesus than when you forgive your brother or forgive your sister. 
So Paul tells the church, church, remove bitterness, remove anger, remove all the junk that the devil wants to store in your heart and replace it with everything that God wants to reveal through your heart. Replace it with kindness, replace it with forgiveness. And then you can walk this new walk that God has called you to walk. Then he gives us one final challenge as members of his church. Paul says, if you wanna walk this walk, if you wanna walk worthy of the calling you've received in Christ, here's the secret formula for success. Are you ready? He said, be an imitator of Jesus Christ. I want you to look at your life and I want you to ask, am I imitating Jesus? When people see me, do they see him? He said, it's the secret formula for success. Be an imitator of Jesus Christ. Make him the model for this walk. You say, man, how do I do that? You know what the Bible says? Walk in love. You wanna imitate Jesus? Walk in his love. Look at verse one. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. When you walk in the love of God, your life will make a difference for the kingdom of God. So may I just ask you a simple question today? Are you walking in that love? Are you walking worthy of the calling you've received in Christ? If so, Paul says, let me give you a few things to think about. In fact, let's review that list before we wrap this thing up. He says, you've got to replace lying with truth telling. You must replace sinful anger with, with righteous anger. You've got to replace stealing with hard work and generosity. You've got to replace destructive words with constructive words. He said, you'll replace rejecting the Holy Spirit with appreciating the Holy Spirit. You'll replace bitterness and anger with kindness and forgiveness. And last but not least, he said, be an imitator of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, when you read through that list and when you hear God's word spoken over you today, is there one of these things that jumps out to you? Maybe there are a couple of these things that the Holy Spirit is, is taking off of this list and he's putting in your heart and he's showing you right now that there's work to be done. I'll tell you, in my life, there is. If that's you, you're not alone. In my life, there's one or two of these things. I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm just thankful you're not done with me right now. Listen, if you have experienced life change through Jesus, here's what that means. You are now on a journey with Jesus, a journey that leads to becoming more like him as you press into him. And that's what moments like these are for, moments where we open up God's word and he speaks truth over our life and we get to decide, how are we going to respond as children of God? Because even though we're saved and even though we're destined for heaven, that doesn't mean that we're perfect. Listen, look around. There is not a, there, there's not a single person in this building that's perfect. Not one of you have it all together. And we like to put on a good show and we like to show up at church and we like, like to act like we got all of our stuff together. But the truth is every single one of us are a work in progress. And I am so thankful that God hasn't given up on me yet. So we have a long way to go. And so believers, as we read through this list today, I want you to ask the question, God, what is it in my life that doesn't look like you? What are the things in my life that need to be chipped away, the things that don't look like you, the things that look like the world? What are the things that the devil is storing in my life that I need to replace today? Because I'm guessing that if we're being brutally honest with ourselves, there are some things that God has spoken over us today that require action. I believe God's given us homework today as believers. And so I encourage you, don't leave this place without committing to God, saying, God, I'm willing to deal with the things that you've revealed in my life. God, I no longer want to be somebody who tells lies. I want to tell the truth. I don't want to have, have sinful anger in my life. I've got things boiling up inside of me that have no business being there. I need to trust you with the things that are making me mad. I've been stealing from the Lord. I haven't been taking what he's blessed me with and reinvesting it into building his kingdom. I've got destructive words that are coming out of my mouth. I get fired up on Facebook and I wanna light everybody up. Listen, I need to remember I'm representing the church. I need to think about the words. Are they flaming arrows coming out of my mouth or are they, are they grace-filled words that are building people up? 
Or maybe you say, man, I've got to replace bitterness in my heart or anger with kindness or forgiveness. Or maybe, maybe we, we've been grieving the Holy Spirit without even knowing it or thinking about it. We've been grieving him because we've been relying on our own power and our own strength. We get to make a choice today. How do we respond to God? And how do we respond to his instruction? And yet there may be people in this room who say, man, if I'm being honest, I don't even have a relationship with God. I've never been saved. I've never even thought about replacing this with this. And if I have, it's been in the flesh as, a, as just a human trying to make myself better. I've never trusted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Maybe today's the day you give him 100% of who you are. And you ask Jake, Jesus to to change your heart and to make you new and to forgive you of your sins. You could be a new creation in Christ today if you're willing to go all in with Jesus Christ. I believe his word always prompts action in our heart. It requires an action step. And today is a day that God's called his church to action. So I ask this one more time, God, what do you want me to do with this? What is it that you're telling me today?